So the main question that we're trying to answer in this theme is where does kelp get its nitrogen? And that can probably be best summarized by this figure from one of Mark's papers, um, which shows, I'm gonna close the participants here, um, shows significant growth of kelp, which is this upper graph, at really low concentrations of nitrate and nitrite, which is along the x-axis here. So this dashed line is thought to represent a concentration at which kelp aren't thought to be able to grow, yet we obviously see that kelp are growing below ambient concentrations of nitrate and nitrite in the water column. And you know every living thing needs nitrogen to build proteins and build enzymes, so kelp is getting nitrogen from somewhere and we want to figure out where. So if it's been a little while since you learned about the nitrogen cycle, um, when you first learned about the nitrogen cycle, you probably got to see a diagram like this because there's always a rabbit in the nitrogen cycle. Uh, so most of the nitrogen on the planet is atmospheric nitrogen, and that's not available to most living things, but it can be fixed into a biologically available form by microbes, which can live in association with certain plants. Those plants are eaten by consumers, uh, represented by this rabbit, whose nitrogen excretion product um, is often ammonium. Uh, that ammonium, NH4, you'll hear a lot about ammonium today, um, can be nitrified by a group of microbes to make nitrate. So nitrate is NO3, and that nitrate can then be denitrified back to N2. So whether you realize it or not, at the time, nitrification and denitrification actually refer to uh, metabolic groups of microbes. Um, in the open ocean, which is the nitrogen cycle that I'm most used to thinking about, um, this is how I think about the nitrogen cycle, so no rabbits, thankfully. Um, nitrogen gas in, in the open ocean is typically fixed by cyanobacteria. Um, this is trichodesmium, an abundant tropical cyanobacteria. So that's, it's fixed into a biologically available form um, by phytoplankton, which are then eaten by consumers, which I've represented by the zooplankton, but there's lots of different sizes of consumers in the ocean. Um, heterotrophic bacteria can break down dissolved organic matter, and together those two groups of organisms release ammonium as their nitrogenous waste product. Um, that ammonium can get, then get retaken up by um, phytoplankton, whether it's these N2 fixers or organisms that aren't able to fix nitrogen. Um, that ammonium can be nitrified to nitrate, and nitrate also is an important nitrogen source for phytoplankton in the surface ocean. And then in um, anoxic regions of the ocean or in anaerobic sediments, that nitrate gets denitrified to nitrogen gas. Um, this is, again, a very simplified view of the nitrogen cycle. But it is the view that um, I came to this project with. And the red arrows here are meant to represent what we think about as the cycle of recycled nitrogen um, in the ocean. So this cycling back and forth between ammonium through phytoplankton and consumers back to ammonium. So the red arrows are recycled in this open ocean way of thinking. So I've had to rethink a little bit about how I think about the nitrogen cycle and trying to be able to contribute to the LTER. Um, we don't think nitrogen fixation is a big part of the nitrogen story in kelp forests. There, are, there have been some heterotrophic bacteria found in association with kelp that can fix nitrogen. Um, we don't find a lot of nitrogen fixing cyanobacteria in the water column. Um, but nitrogen does find its way into the primary producers in the system, whether those are eukaryotic phytoplankton or kelp, through assimilation. Um, those primary producers are eaten by various consumers, um, which excrete ammonium, which we'll hear about from Joey later. And also, you'll hear some more about urea. So even though urea isn't the primary nitrogenous waste product of most aquatic organisms, they still do um, excrete urea as the breakdown product of um, various metabolic intermediates. Um, we don't think that this microbial process of nitrification is that important um, in kelp forests, but to be honest, I don't think anyone's ever actually measured it. And nitrate is a really important form of nitrogen, which is delivered um, by upwelling. And so ammonium and nitrate can both, as I said earlier, be assimilated by these primary um, producers to fuel their growth. So let's talk a little bit more about nitrate. Um, this figure on the left is from that same figure of, um, from Mark's paper from 2013. This figure on the right is um, a paper from Sally McIntyre's group 
um, Fram et al. 2008. And, and in this paper, um, they had this really nice figure, which I think summarizes um, the nitrogen, the large scale nitrogen dynamics in this area. 68% of the annual nitrate supplied to the kelp forest arrives during a two month period. And so much nitrate is coming in that the percent of available nitrogen that's taken up is actually pretty small during that time. And, and even at its maximum, um, in this paper, they calculated something like 5% of the available nitrate that's delivered is actually taken up by kelp. So because the nitrate arrives during this relatively constrained temporal period, we have this question of where the kelp are getting this nitrogen that's fueling their growth during the summertime period. And these are two tables from that um, same Fram et al. paper that um, highlight this a little bit. So here they um, did a really um, interesting and careful modeling study um, to look at how much um, nitrate the kelp should have been taking up during that time. So that's this, this number here. Um, there were also some direct measurements, so that's these numbers here. So the red box are the numbers that um, were determined for the summertime period, and the units are micromoles per square meter. So these numbers, so somewhere between 100 and 400 micromoles per square meter, those are really big um, when we compare that in this other table to the amount of nitrate that we think is being delivered by these various mechanisms. Um, mostly during the summertime period, there's not um, upwelling in the classical Ekman upwelling sense, but there can still be delivery of deep water through internal waves. And so in this paper, they calculated that could supply about 40 micromole um, per square meter of nitrate. So this number 40 is quite a bit lower than um, 100 or 400. So, so where is this extra nitrogen coming from? And in this paper, they um, came up with a figure that something like 50% of the kelp's nitrogen demand should be met not by nitrate, but by recycled nitrogen. And this is something that I've had to you know, think about a, a bit in terms of the kelp forest and how that contrasts with how we're used to thinking about recycled nitrogen in the open ocean. So in a, a classic biological oceanography sense, when we talk about um, new nitrogen, um, nitrate is new nitrogen and ammonium is recycled. And this comes from um, this really um, classic concept in biological oceanography than the new production paradigm. And that idea is just that any production in the surface ocean that is fueled by nitrate coming in from deep waters, um, so the production meaning the carbon fixation um, that can be fueled by that amount of nitrogen, um, those two things are linked by the red field ratio. And any nitrate coming in has to be balanced by an export of carbon going out. Because in the open ocean, we can make an assumption, roughly speaking, that the surface ocean is in steady state. Um, and that same idea, any phytoplankton growth that's fueled by ammonium, um, because that's coming from within the system, that's not linked to carbon leaving it. So this is where this I idea, at least for me, of what, what's new and what's recycled nitrogen comes from. But as Mark pointed out the last time he gave this talk, this way of thinking is probably not the best way of thinking what constitutes new nitrogen in terms of the kelp forest. So this is a slide from Mark's presentation, um, thinking about what recycled actually means in the context of a benthic coastal ecosystem where, for one, it's not really in steady state, and for two, the um, primary producers are fixed to the bed. So Thinking about it this way, new nitrogen is any form of nitrogen that's brought in from outside the system. And we have to think about what bounds we want to draw on our box and what actually is the system. Um, and recycled and regenerated nitrogen is that which is recycled within the kelp forest system. So we're not really necessarily um, breaking things up by nitrate and ammonium anymore. We're thinking about new nitrogen as anything that's brought in from outside the system, whether it's ammonium or whether it's nitrate. And so one of the forms of nitrogen that we've, or um, that Dan and Mark and uh, Jason Smith, who is a postdoc here for a number of years, have been thinking about is the role of urea 
um, in fueling kelp production. Um, and Jason found, um, he made measurements for um, about two years of urea concentrations, which we've continued, and I'll show you some of that data in a second. Um, and he found that urea is present at biologically significant concentrations in the water column. So this is urea N. So the urea molecule has two Ns in it, so you have to kind of pay attention a little bit when you're reporting those units. So urea N in micromolar varies, um, and it as a fraction of the total DIN, which is shown in this bottom panel, um, it's quite important in the summertime because that's when nitrate concentrations are the lowest. So I've lost my pointer here. There it is. Um, so these red bars are the urea concentration, and you can see in the summertime, so July, August, September, this red bar is quite a bit bigger than ammonium or nitrate. And so that's what led to the hypothesis that perhaps urea is fueling some of the um, kelp production. Um, in my lab, Natalie has taken over um, these measurements of urea and ammonium in the monthly time series, and um, she put together this nice plot, so updating these, this time series that Jason started, which shows um, pretty much the same thing, but this is a really, I think, really nice graphical depiction of the seasonal cycle of these different nitrogen species. Um, so the, the grayish bars, that's the nitrate concentration. So when there's a lot of upwelling um, in March and April, basically right now, nitrate concentrations in the water column, this should be micromolar, um, are, are high. But in the summertime, the um, relative importance of ammonium and urea is, is quite a bit higher. And she also has this broken up here by season. So you can see, in, again, in the summertime, um, urea concentrations are much, much higher than nitrate and nitrite. And so again, this is um, Jason Smith's work where he was looking at whether or not cape was, kelp was even capable of taking up this urea and being able to use it um, to fuel primary production. And the answer is yes, it can. Um, so this is the uptake of different forms of nitrogen by kelp, um, and he found that um, in fact, kelp can take up urea, and that in certain times of the year, so in this plot down here at the bottom, when phytoplankton are taking up more than kelp, you'll find the box up here, and when kelp uptake is similar to phytoplankton, um, the box is down closer to this line. So at some times of the year, um, kelp are taking up um, as much nitrate, in this case, um, as phytoplankton. So this formed the basis of what was in the renewal proposal of, if you think about um, phytoplankton, phytoplankton are small, and small things have a really high surface area to volume ratio, which should make them really, really good at taking up anything that's at a low concentration. So the idea that this big um, macroalgae could outcompete phytoplankton um, it is pretty interesting to think about how that could work. How is it possible that kelp could outcompete phytoplankton, which should be so good at taking up things at low concentration? And one of the hypotheses was, again, um, I'll talk about it, I'll show a data slide in, in a second, is that phytoplankton appear to only be able to take up dissolved inorganic nitrogen during the day. So if kelp are able to take up um, dissolved inorganic nitrogen at night, that might be a way that they can outcompete phytoplankton, which should be better um, at low concentrations. And so that formed one of the hypotheses that was laid out in the proposal. Um, so these are the hypotheses that this group is hopefully testing, um, that phytoplankton across the shelf, so just outside um, our study area, set the concentration of various forms of regenerated nitrogen that wind up in the kelp forest that at night, um, the use of recycled nitrogen by phytoplankton drops, um, but that kelp are able to take it up during the night, and that this nighttime uptake should fuel um, a significant portion of their nitrogen demand. So this is um, work that just was published last year um, by Jason Smith and Dan, Bob, and Mark. Um, comparing the affinity of kelp and phytoplankton for um, nitrate and urea. So here I'm showing the urea graphs. So um, if you haven't looked at a plot like this in a while, these are Michaelis-Menten plots, where on the 
x-axis is the concentration of substrate, in this case urea, and on the y-axis is how fast that organism is able to take it up. And if you take the concentration at half the maximum uptake, that's a um, measure that we can compare across different groups of organisms to look at their affinity, and that value is called Ks. So at about a half a micromolar, um, phytoplankton are at half their um, maximum uptake. So the lower your um, Ks is, the higher your affinity for that. So you can see the phytoplankton um, really can kick kelp butt, I guess you could say, um, in terms of the uptake rate at which these organisms can access urea. Um, not surprisingly, I guess, um, because, as I said, small phytoplankton should be really good at taking up things at low concentrations. However, um, again, what led to the um, formation of this hypothesis was that if we look at the ratio of the uptake in the dark um, to the ratio of the uptake in the light for these different groups of organisms, kelp are able to increase their dark uptake relative to light uptake when compared to phytoplankton. So this definitely supports that idea that the, the way that kelp are able to outcompete phytoplankton for dissolved inorganic nitrogen, particularly urea, is that they can take um, these nitrogen forms up at higher rates in the dark than phytoplankton. So that's the background for this theme. Um, now I want to give a few um, updates of what's going on with these different uh, bullet points. So one thing that um, was a bit foreign to me when I first started working in the LTR was the units that were being used to make some of these comparisons. And I'm used to thinking about things in this way, as Dan Reed would say, I'm a box and arrows person. Um, so I'm used to thinking about plots like this, where the units are in mass per unit time. And um, this is just an example from a coastal carbon, West Coast carbon budget um, that came out about 10 years ago. And so I, th I thought it would be a worthy goal to try and put something like this together for nitrogen in the um, study area of the LTER. And um, certainly the work by Fram and, and Sally McIntyre um, was a really great start on this. Um, so I put, started to take a first pass of um, trying to constrain, what, think about what these arrows are in terms of our study area. And I had a lot of help from people trying to get numbers on these arrows. Um, but then um, it was brought to my attention that this maybe was not the best way to do it because of how physically dynamic the area is. Um, and so Nick has sort of um, taken on this project. So Nick and his graduate student Cecily are taking a, a different approach and that's an ongoing project um, to work out this nitrogen budget. In terms of the time series, um, so this is our COVID data gap. Um, training new people, I'm sure as a lot of you have experienced, training new people in the laboratory has been really challenging um, when you can only have one person in the laboratory at, the, at a time. Um, but some in kind of interesting things may be worth mentioning um, is that when the time series of urea first started, the concentrations were um, relatively high, about a micromolar. And, um, they seem to have gone down over time. And at first I was worried this was somehow related to our taking over of the time series, but um, we took over right around here. So this decrease in concentrations was already happening before we took over the time series. So these are the different sites, um, different monthly monitoring sites. You can see that urea concentrations have come down. So thinking about why that is, um, I'd be open to any feedback about what was going on at this time, if this was related to mudslides or um, El Ninos or, or whatever. Um, the next slide is Joey's slide. So Joey, do you want to turn your mic on and explain this part? Sure. Um, if you wouldn't mind clicking for me, because I think I can take over. Yeah. But um, I, you can click through all of it, honestly. I can all be up at once. Okay. Yeah. Um, so just an update on what I've been doing with the consumer side of things is thinking about how fishes um, excrete ammonium and what that means for the total amount of ammonium coming out of consumers on the reef. Um, so that was provided from June and Scott 
um, at Moss Landing, their colleagues that are interested in nitrogen recycling as well. And so June collected a bunch of, sorry about the noise, June collected a bunch of uh, fish excretion data for her master's thesis and then was gracious enough to allow us to borrow it and use it for our own purposes. Um, so what I did is I paired that data along with the invert data I collected with the LTE consumer biomass time series. And the questions we're asking with that is thinking about how disturbance frequency can mediate the amount of <clears throat> nitrogen coming out of consumers as a function of decreasing kelp biomass because kelp presumably as a foundation species um, would increase excretions um, if there's more consumers reliant upon kelp. So that's what I'm looking at in this next chapter. Um, just a quick number to throw at you, uh, fishes excrete based on that data all years, um, all sites and treatments included here, uh, 54.6 micromoles of ammonium per meter square per hour, whereas invertebrates excrete about half of that. Um, so that's kind of important to think about when we're factoring in fish now, they're pretty important for recycling ammonium. Um, but that's not surprising considering the work we've seen in other systems. Um, as far as the experiment's concerned and how it affects fish excretion rates, if you remove giant kelp annually, by the end of our LTE experiment um, over a 10 year period, it reduced fish excretions by 58%. Um, and it's because it adversely affected 13 of those 21 species, including these really important recyclers that I think are, rel are reliant on kelp um, as habitat more than maybe the others. Um, but that's kelp bass, sheephead, cinaritas, and black surf perch. Um, and then also interesting, uh, invert excretions were 26% lower um, in the frequently disturbed plots as well. Um, but we know from a previous previous work that I did um, that the big driver of changes in invert excretions um, was due to the sea star wasting disease in 20, um, that happened after the 2014-2015 warming event. And sea stars were a pretty big contributor of um, ammonium at the time. So that's one thing that's happening behind the scenes outside the experiment is this regional effect of warming on invertebrates. Um, but what's interesting is that they seem to be higher in a kelp forest than one that's been disturbed. So there could be some level of mediating that effect um, where there's more kelp. And I'm looking into that right now. Uh, and the last thing is um, part of that experiment is now taking a look at how much of the demand by the understory or giant kelp is, is met by consumer excretions. Um, and so the way I've been calculating that is taking MPP data in the same plots where we've taken the consumer data for both understory and giant kelp, and then thinking about um, how much of that MPP, so sorry, how much nitrogen in the MPP is required for it to maintain production. And so we're trying to look at that value now um, and see how much they can meet. Thanks, Joey. Um Maybe it would be appropriate if anyone wanted to ask you questions now while you've got your mic queued up. Does anyone have any questions for Joey about this experiment or the any of these data? And, and just turn your mic on because the way I have things set up, I can't really see anybody. Okay. Thanks again, Joey. Um, so what are we going to do next now that we're slowly making our way back into the lab and we can think about having more than one person um, in the lab and getting people up to speed? A lot of these haven't changed since Mark presented this in January of 2020. Um, we want to define what the actual recycled production rate is within the water column. Um, Joey's work is really important for looking at the consumer piece of that, but there's certainly a microbial piece, and this ties in a bit to um, some of the work that Chance presented a couple of weeks ago um, related to microbial organic matter cycling, that organic matter cycling certainly has an ammonium production associated with it. Um, but we want to measure that and see what kind of diel changes there are. Um, um, Haley Lohman, I believe, is just finishing up um, her manuscript about ammonium flux from the sediments. Um, and we want to just continue these time series of nitrate, ammonium, and um, total dissolved nitrogen in the um, monthly time series sites. And then to start to look at this partitioning, this competition between 
kelp and phytoplankton a little more. Um, those experiments were done in the lab, and so we'd like to try and um, take those into the field and do some of these bag experiments to look at the concentration dependence of N uptake by kelp and phytoplankton. Um, and you'll hear in Tiffany's presentation um, how that might be related to surge uptake or uptake when there happens to be a pulse, um, which you could think about also associated with what Joey was talking about. If you have a consumer coming by and um, there's a pulse of ammonium, how are, are kelp um, poised to take advantage of that? That might help them outcompete um, phytoplankton. And eventually, um, we'd like to bring in, um, Holly Moeller is also part of this group, um, even though we haven't met in over a year, um, and try and um, extend this to larger scales um, and take advantage of the LTER time series. So what are the proposed experiments? Well, in the lab, one of the things that we need to do is spin up um, an isotope method for measuring um, stable isotope ratios in ammonium. Um, which has been challenging. Um, you know, the analytical lab is finally back online. We're working through some mass spectrometry, mass spectrometry issues, um, but now that um, we have clearance for me to be in the lab at the same time as Natalie, um, we can hopefully get that going. Um, in the field, then we can, once we get that going, we can start to do some of these um, regeneration rates and take on the experiments I mentioned in the last slide. Um, and again, these Modeling approaches, the nitrogen budget, I think, is a big part of what, what I would consider a model. Um, we're also involving the um, group down at UCLA to compare um, our nitrogen budget that's made from um, empirical measurements with their model to see where that differs. Um, one thing in particular I wanted to bring up, because we've heard about these in and out experiments a lot, um, I know that Natalie is excited, and I'm also very excited to try and incorporate any uh, measurements that we're able to make into any in and out experiment that actually happened, happens. Um, these are data um, from uh, chance, chances experiments. Um, Natalie was measuring ammonia. So um, here are different places within the kelp forest, and these are ammonium concentrations. So this is upstream. The arrow is showing inside the kelp forest and then downstream. So when concentrations are low, you can see that ammonium is elevated within the kelp forest, and perhaps that's due to consumers, perhaps that's due to microbial processes, but we can see elevated ammonium relative to upstream um, that starts to fade a little bit downstream. And she observed the same thing in March. However, if you get a pulse of um, external ammonium, I, I don't know when the sampling was relative to any kind of rainfall event in March, but when concentrations are high, you don't see that nice pattern. You don't see elevated ammonium within the kelp forest. Um, so continuing these um, types of measurements with any kind of in and out work that people might be doing, we'd be very interested in collaborating with people on. Um, she also measured urea, and you don't, you don't see the same thing. So I think that's also um, kind of interesting. Again, the arrow is inside the kelp forest, um, upstream and downstream. Um, what does this mean? I'm not sure. Um, but we're looking forward to taking more measurements like that. Um, before I turn it over to Tiffany, I also wanted to say thank you to the monthly sampling team, um, Janice Jones and Ellie Halewood, who really help us um, keep the data flowing and get us organized. Um, for monthly sampling things. And I also wanted to thank every building committee for every meeting that you've sat in to allow us to be able to get back in the lab and doing some of these measurements. Um, we've had a lot of challenges to um, making some of these measurements that I won't get into, but um, being able to use different spaces and different buildings has been really useful. So uh, thank you. And I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to Tiffany, who's going to tell you about her work on surge uptake of dissolved inorganic nitrogen. You ready to share? Yeah. Uh, yeah, let me use this here. And I'm at not the beginning of my PowerPoint. Okay. okay, hopefully this is fine and that you don't also see yourselves on my screen. Um, so hi, I'm Tiffany Cedeno. I'm a recent master's graduate from IGPMS. Um, and today I'm gonna to be talking about the work I've done with uh, Dan, Bob, and Mark on kind of looking at that potential for surge uptake within macrocystis in response to pulses of three different forms of nitrogen. 
So this is really going to focus on what Allison was talking about with that kind of nitrogen depletion that we're seeing in the summer and that kind of that space of where we don't really know where that nitrogen is coming from that the kelp is using to kind of maintain that growth throughout that summer. So the first thing I'm going to kind of be talking about is what is surge uptake. So a lot of times when we think about uptake, we kind of think about it kind of as this curve. Uh, in this case, we're going to be talking about uh, that S is going to actually represent kind of time. So as kelp is kind of introduced to a pulse of nitrogen or a sudden increase in nitrogen, we think of it as probably taking some time to kind of ramp up the amount it's able to take in. And so that's going to be that blue curve and eventually leveling out and maintaining that um, optimal uptake that I can have with that um, concentration that it is exposed to. Um, and with surge uptake, which we've seen evidence in, in certain forms of phytoplankton and macroalgae, um, there's this idea is that when they are first exposed to that pulse of nitrogen, they're able to very quickly ramp up their uptake rate to a very high, almost about at that B max uptake to take in as much as they can. And then once kind of as that pulse kind of remains around, then they kind of slow down and then eventually again reaching that optimal uptake rate um, for that uh, substrate concentration. And so a lot of this has been studied uh, for other forms of macroalgae and phytoplankton. Um, there is a study by Thomas and Harrison in 1987 that kind of looked at this for five different species of macroalgae, but looking more on the smaller scale. Um, whereas Dai and Yap in 2001 were looking at it for a nitrogen uh, for a K alvarezi, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, which uh, typically grows in a nitrogen depleted environment. And so both of those found evidence of surge uptake, but only with ammonium. And so we wanted to look at this, uh, not just with ammonium, but also with nitrate. And then also with urea, as it's something that we've been looking at in this lab recently. Um, so with these incubate, so for this, we use these incubation experiments. This is a very crude drawing that I made myself. I tried. <laughs> so with this, what we did is that we collected uh, blades from random fronds from the tough forest that we have here off the coast. Um, and then we kind of well, we, sorry. So we use these labeled N15 in uh, 10 micromolar concentrations for this experiment. So we introduced this pulse of nitrogen to uh, blades, individual blades. And so we had it divided between nitrate, ammonium, and urea. And we also wanted to look at kind of going back to this curve uh, at which time points we kind of see this go along. So it's kind of hitting along this curve to see if we can see that kind of dynamic pattern with the uptake. So the times we use were one minute, five, 15, and 45 to kind of get that very, that start of where that would be. Um, and so we looked at this separately for nitrate ammonium urea. And with this, we also used different blades. So we had different blades for the one minute, the five, or a separate set for the five, a separate set for the 15. So these were all done with just that pulse. And then we also, from looking at the literature, there was a study by Delia and D. Boer from 1978 that also studied that surge uptake. And they found that they mostly saw this evidence within nitrogen starved organisms. So in order to kind of test that and also look at if this is a capability they have at all times, or if they kind of adapt to it. We did this experiment during the late spring before the nitrogen depletion um, starts to ramp up and in the late summer when they've kind of, that those blades have kind of become acclimated to this nitrogen depleted environment. And so we did those five experiments in the spring and the summer. And for each of these, we collected about 41 blades. So having three for those three replicates for each, um, nitrogen species, but then also saving these five blades from each experiment to be used as control blades. So those wouldn't be run through any um, experiment, but they were analyzed in the same way as by being dried, uh, weighed, and then run for the, 
mass spectrometer for CHN analysis. And that was to kind of give us a baseline of um, the end status and the blade status of blades from that environment. And so I'm going to go ahead and start talking about the results that we found from this. Uh, so for that, we first were looking at kind of that, like I was saying, that end status to see if maybe the uptake patterns we're seeing are potentially caused by that the status of nitrogen within that blade. So looking at that spring versus summer effect, uh, what we thought was actually kind of interesting in that for that, those blades, which were very standardized in their collection for those control blades, we actually saw that there was a very slight but significant um, higher nitrogen status in those blades from the summer, that's from the spring, even though the ones from the summer were growing in a nitrogen depleted environment. Um, and so also looking at it for kind of with the ones that were run through the experiment, looking at those differences between those different time scales, and if we didn't, if we saw differences in those nitrogen percentages there, um, for both that the effect through uh, the pulse duration, but then also the nitrogen form, we actually saw no significant effect of the end status. So that kind of allowed us to rule out that kind of prior nitrogen status as a cause for any uptake patterns we see. So that would mean that. Uh, any changes in patterns would most likely be caused by separate mechanism than just um, the end status of the blade prior to exposure to that pulse. So going into kind of what those patterns looked like, uh, we're kind of, we're actually going to show them in more of a bar graph form. Uh, so looking at that specific uptake, we looked at the differences between those patterns in the summer and in the spring and for nitrate, we saw that there was actually kind of a higher overall like uptake we are seeing in the summer versus in the spring. But the patterns that we we're seeing were ultimately the same, which is why we're only seeing showing one here. So for both the spring and summer, we saw that there was a significantly higher uptake rate for the one minute compared to the five, 15 and 45. Um, and then for the, for urea, we are actually also seeing that increased uptake in the summer compared to the spring, but for the most part throughout that entire uptake, we actually saw a very constant, um, non-significant uh, changes in the uptake rate for urea. Uh, ammonium had what I would consider the most dynamic pattern in that we saw uh, changes in not just the, um, the rate taken up between the spring and summer, but also the pattern that we were seeing. For the spring, we we're seeing an increased rate at the one minute, but not significantly so from the other times. But for the summer, we saw a very high increase and significant increase in the one minute and five minute uptake than compared to the 15 and the 45, showing that we had that kind of increased uptake right at the beginning and then it kind of slowing down. And then we also, like I was saying before, looking at that end status of the blade, we also kind of compared those uptakes to that end status. And we saw with that, that the uh, nitrate and urea had a significant correlation between the end status and that uptake, which would kind of show that with nitrate and urea, we didn't see that much of that pattern we would be expecting with surge uptake. We were seeing patterns that did follow more closely along with their uptake being kind of determined and affected by that end status. Whereas with ammonium, we saw that there was there was not a significant correlation between blade status and uptake rate. So again, pushing that forward, that idea that surge uptake is not necessarily caused by the end status and is most likely a separate mechanism, if that is what we are seeing here in the ammonium. Uh, so we also, with this last time I discussed this data, we had uh, an idea brought up in that the kind of patterns we were seeing towards that 15 and 45 could be affected by the fact that the way that these were measured, we had the blade that was run for 45 minutes um, analyzed and we estimated their uptake rate, but that most likely uh, included that that kind of those patterns that we saw throughout the this whole uh, time frame. So if we saw surge uptake at one minute or five minutes, 
um, that was included in that 45 minutes. And so that kind of rate that we we're seeing was kind of averaged over. So it might be inflating or deflating those patterns. So we decided to kind of back calculate and look at um, the uptake rate within these kind of intervals. So taking those an average of those rates we saw at one minute and factoring them into that overall rate we saw at five to kind of see if if we could see the same patterns to see if maybe that calculation we were doing prior was affecting the results we're seeing. So now we have these intervals from zero to one minute, uh, one to five, five to 15, and 15 to 45 to kind of look at what we estimate that uptake pattern and rate was right at within that time frame, and not including any uptake or patterns we saw previously. And with that, we saw very similar results to what we were doing in that uh, for nitrate, we saw that there was an increased rate within the summer compared to the spring and that that one zero to one minute still had that significant increase compared to the uh, going from five and beyond. With the urea, we actually saw that it did change it a bit in that now spring and summer were not significantly different from each other. And they both had um, a non-significant change between their uptakes and also within that time duration, they had that very um, constant uptake going. And then with ammonium, we saw a very similar pattern in that uh, spring and summer were significantly different from each other and that um, we saw more evidence of that pattern in the summer than in the spring, which had some dynamics to its pattern, but not as significantly so, although we do now see that the one minute did have a little bit more to do, a uh, little more similarity with the summer than it did with the spring, with the other data. And then we're also, we're looking at kind of biomass normalized rates. So looking at um, including those, the weight of the sample looked at to kind of see if that um, affects the rate and then also to kind of bring it into units that we can use to kind of contextualize it. So with this, we have uh, nitrate, urea, and ammonium, uh, nitrate showing very similar patterns. Now actually when normalized to the weight of the blade, um, we saw no difference between the spring and the summer um, in their kind of uptake rate. With urea, we did see some differences. For the most part, it was still very constant level, but we did see those very small minute differences, such as with a 15 minute, um, with there being more of a difference between that spring and the summer. And then with urea, again, we saw those very similar patterns. We're seeing a very significant increase in the one in five in the summer, and that increase for the one minute in the spring, but not significantly so. So looking at it with this biomass normalized rates, we wanted to kind of bring it into what is the ecological relevance of this. So talking about those sources of kind of these pulse, so these uh, pulse nitrogen. So coming with nitrate, we think of more in the form of internal waves. So they can kind of come through the forest, dissipate. Um, and then with ammonium urea coming more from uh, organism secretion, most likely from fish in which it's more pulsed as the fish kind of comes by. So we're kind of trying to look at with these pulses, how much would we really need to kind of meet that uh, nitrogen demand or that kind of that nitrogen uptake that we're seeing. Uh, so looking at the long-term data that we had, we kind of create an estimate of the daily nitrogen uptake within the spring and summer. We had 320, uh, micrograms of nitrogen in the spring and 270 micrograms in the summer. So that kind of change in how much they're uptaking. And then kind of looking at how many of these pulses would be needed to kind of make up for what we're seeing them uptake. So with nitrate, we are looking at those 45 minute exposures because Fram did discuss that these the idea of these internal waves, they are pulses, but they are more prolonged pulses. So we use the 45 minute exposure to kind of equal what we would assume would be about an internal wave. And we estimated about seven pulses in the spring and six pulses in the summer on a daily basis would be needed to maintain that amount of nitrogen. Uh, Fram also discusses that he believes that 
uh, internal waves would make up about a third of the demand for nitrogen for macrocystis. Um, and with this, we know, we also discussed that internal waves come about twice a day. So with the amount of pulses we're seeing, we're seeing them make up about that same amount of being a third of the amount needed to meet that nitrogen demand that we're seeing. Uh, so our, with that, we determined that our findings did follow uh, decently closely with FRAM's findings. And for ammonia and urea also, it becomes a little harder to contextualize based on the fact that we're looking at these pulses on a very small scale and they would need to be estimated more in terms of the entire forest. So with this kind of grams per dry weight estimate that we're using for uh, spring and summer uptake, we've determined that with ammonium, you'd need about 121 pulses. If you're looking at a one minute pulse, 71, and then it's five minutes less. And it's more to look at the idea of the sizing between the spring and the summer, and then also for urea with the difference between, the, between ammonium and urea and how much would be needed. Um, and so also hearing Joey discuss kind of like what they're looking at with the fish excretion and the work they want to do going forward. Um, I do feel like this could also, it would be very interesting to look at that as well, because I could also see with that amount of ammonium and urea that we're seeing go into the forest um, and how much they're uptaking. If, for example, ammonium is able to increase that uptake for that first one to five minutes, that that pulse becomes available, that could potentially increase the total amount that macrocystis is able to utilize from that excretion. So going into our kind of summary of findings for this, we did determine that macrocystis is able to increase its uptake of nitrate uh, with that one minute and for ammonium exhibiting the strongest surge response within those very shorter amount of time. So with that one to five, um, although this may not be a result of the end conditions directly, as we saw with ammonium, in that it did not relate to the end status of the blades um, prior. Uh, but with this, we also determined that surge uptake of ammonium and urea patches will most likely not be enough to meet that kelp and demand based on how small these kind of patch areas we were looking at was and how large and vast the, the kelp forest on its own is. Uh, with the nitrate um, surge uptake, since it was on a one minute time scale, it's most likely not be uh, utilized or useful in exploiting the elevated nitrate in those internal waves. But with nitrate, even with internal waves, it does appear to be capable of helping supply that summertime kelp demand, just not completely but having a significant increase within it. And that the low persistent uptake of lower background concentrations of ammonium urea are more likely to help meet this deficit as Allison described. And that it's most likely not like a very quick, they kind of grab all the nitrogen they need for the day and are done. It's probably more of that persistent background concentrations that we're seeing. Uh, and I think that is all that I have. I will stop sharing. How do I do this? Thanks, Tiffany. That was mm -hmm. great. A lot of hard work there. <laughs> um, so I guess t we got a late start because of some technical difficulties. But um, so people probably have some one o'clock meetings. But if anyone has any questions for me or Joey or Tiffany, um, I'm happy to take them. Um, I have a question about the the urea data <clears throat> um, that Natalie, that you showed that Natalie collected, you know, inside and outside the forest doesn't really hint at any kind of big source inside the forest as it would might be suggested by Joey's work on the fish. And obviously those are concentrations and not just, you know, um, and that don't reflect whether maybe rapid uptake or some, something like that, I guess that might influence those, but do you, feel like, um, do you think that, what do you think about that? <laughs> well, one, I don't think Joey showed any urea data. He was just talking about ammonium data. And our ammonium data definitely 
when, ammonium, sorry, yeah, yes. Ammonium, the ammonium concentrations, I was actually surprised we could see a difference. So when the concentrations are low, you can see elevated ammonium within the kelp forest, which I think is pretty consistent with what Joey saw. Um, in terms of the urea, if the, our ammonium measurements are quite a bit more sensitive and precise than the urea measurements. So um, we need a, a bigger difference <laughs> to be able to see it in urea, but I think it's still worth doing. And I think in summer is that when we'll have the greatest chance of seeing something. You know, February and March are probably the worst time to actually see that difference. So I'm hopeful. I think it's still worth pursuing. But maybe I could ask Joey, are you doing urea measurements? No, we never did. And neither did June and Scott. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not the most fun thing to measure. <laughs> um, I saw Sally and Craig have a hand up. Hi, right, Sally. Allison, we had a speaker last year who talked about a biofilm on top of the kelp blades. And that was like, wow, for me to think of it, not just as like, <laughs> I want to say plant. Remember, I'm so old, I still think of plants and animals. But um, that makes me think that the uptake is mediated by those bacteria. I don't know if there's any archaea. And then I, and then I started to wonder, well, how would you partition it? Um, and then I began to imagine things that you guys, I mean, you're so modern, um, that, that you might do to kind of like kill that community, but not the, not the kelp itself, or maybe, maybe some of the communities of bacteria are so much the same that you could do similar uptake experiments. So I was just really curious how you weave that new understanding about the nature of the surface of a kelp blade with, with these more traditional types of measurements. I think it's a great question, and I think it's certainly something I thought about in um, seeing Tiffany's data and that the seasonal differences she saw are really interesting. And thinking about to what extent how the community on the blades might be contributing to the seasonal differences. Um, I'll let her speak about, I know she did try um, to remove as much as possible that surficial community before. Oh, really? Okay, very cool. Yeah. We're, yeah. People are definitely thinking about it. Um, I think it's also a place for, I don't know, um, it was the week that Chance gave his talk. Lizzie's group is using some microscopy um, techniques where you can have a labeled substrate, a flora, fluorescently labeled substrate that microbes take up. So mm -hmm. that might give us a way to visualize the microbes on the kelp and how, um, how that's working. But it's a good question. Okay. Tiffany, do you have anything you want to say about that? Okay. Thanks, Sally. Sure. Craig? Uh, just a quick question about the, the pulse, um, the pulse data. Is there any evidence or what's the flexibility in this in the C-N ratio of the kelp itself? Is it is that plastic or is it pretty constant? Yes, no. Uh, we didn't get much of a chance to examine the kind of the carbon ratio between um, the kind of the patterns we are seeing. But you saw you showed blade nitrogen percentage, and that varied between something like one and four percent. Is that thinking back to? Okay, so presumably the other percentage is that's varying with along with that is carbon. So, um, okay. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks everyone for coming and for bearing with the initial technical difficulties. And um, thanks again to Joey, Tiffany, and Natalie for contributing data for that, that talk. Yeah. I, I just want to comment, what a cool idea to do these experiments, imagining the pulse from the internal waves. You know, that's, that's really pretty slick. And also I think it would be, when I think about those, I think about them carrying nitrate more in the upwelling season and it might be of interest to know what they're actually transporting in non-upwelling seasons, because they could, you know, like those sediment sources or the urea that's more in the water column, that they might be critical for transporting those elements at that time. So it's pretty, pretty neat perspective. I'm going to tell John Fram, he'll be fascinated. I think we might need you to lead a discussion of that paper again, Sally. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks, everyone.